All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Bowling. Uh, I am on the RHEL product management team um, for Red Hat Enterprise Linux with Red Hat. Um, and my area of focus is uh, RHEL automation and management. How can we make RHEL easier uh, for you to manage and configure? And of course, uh, all of the, the things that we do also translates to CentOS and Fedora. And with me is Pavel. Would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Pavel Cahina. I am uh, the developer lead of the system uh, roles project. And I'm a senior software engineer at uh, core services at the RHEL business unit at Red Hat. So today we're going to talk to you uh, and, and educate you about uh, Linux system roles. And the, um, so the, the overview of this, this talk will be, you know, the overview of the system roles. Uh, we're going to give you an introduction to two examples, the network and storage roles, uh, because those are, are two roles that we're getting a lot of feedback that those are some of the most commonly requested or, um, or uh, needed types of automation when managing RHEL. Um, and then Pavel is going to show you some examples, some demos of how to use it. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the common role challenges. So the reason we're here, uh, I spent about 14 years as a sysadmin for a few different companies. So I've, I've kind of been there with you, you know, managing, configuring, operating systems and, and taking care of things when they go bad. And uh, back in the day, I wrote a lot of really bad shell and Perl scripts. Uh, I was very proud of them at the time, but um, I, I pity anybody who had to take them over after I left. Uh, and they got the job done. They did, needed, you know, they, they helped me do what I needed to do. But I can completely relate to uh, these examples where, you know, we need to do something. We write some clever script, and, you know, in Perl, I loved regex and I did a lot of horrible things, but you know, it was fun. Some of them were wicked cool. Um, I didn't always remember a year later why I wrote some of it, but you know, it worked at the time. But as things change, uh, you know, stuff broke. And we see that all the time with RHEL, the transition from RHEL 4 to 5 to 6 to 7, and all of the rapid changes that happen in Fedora. Uh, things change, and your scripts need to be maintained. And, of course, the cycle is rinsed and repeated. Um, so one of the, the questions we're asking ourselves is, how can we make this easier? And as things change, how can we, Red Hat and the Fedora ecosystem, how can we take on some of that technical debt uh, so that we maintain this so that you don't have to? Um, and so what we have, our goal is to provide a collection of Ansible roles that function as a consistent configuration interface to RHEL and Fedora. And when I say RHEL, you know, you can insert CentOS there, but uh, usually I'm, I'm usually saying RHEL and Fedora most of the time, so I'm not ignoring CentOS. Um, and how can we ensure that they're compatible and tested on a regular basis with Fedora, RHEL 7 and 8, uh, and future versions? Um, and some of them are also compatible where appropriate with RHEL 6 uh, today. Um, and, and ensure that they're constantly compatible and tested as things change. And so we're abstracting configuration from implementation. And what I mean by that is as tools and utilities change, um, networking is a great example. You, your application needs an IP address uh, and maybe a bonded pair or, or multiple aggregated network interfaces. Lots of times our sysadmins don't necessarily care about bonding versus teaming or um, init scripts network configuration versus network D versus other things in the ecosystem like system D, network D, or maybe some future crazy wild idea that somebody dreams up that turns out to be awesome. How can all, all the sysadmin cares is this team is asking me to stand up this database and it, it needs, you know, bonded networks. 
All I care about is the IP address and multiple NICs. That's all I care about. I don't want to care about all the utilities, all the low-level technologies. I'm overwhelmed. I've got too much to do. There's too much to learn. I can't absorb it all. So we put that technical debt, the community, we put that technical debt on users. So we're abstracting this. So we're giving you a simple way to describe I got an IP address, I want a bonded pair. Just make it so, I don't care about the details. Just make it work so that I can go to lunch with my friends. Uh, and, and so that's what we're doing. And it's also critical that this is maintained by Fedora and REL engineers. We couldn't just go to Ansible and say, hey, do this for us, because they're not experts at the networking stack. They don't know what's going on in networking upstream and community. They're experts at designing an automation framework. So we need our RHEL and Fedora subsystem engineers need to be the experts of that subsystem and um, knowing when things are being developed and how. And so um, we're working with a number of different teams um, to, uh, to develop this and put in automated CI testing in Fedora so that as these change and evolve and new functionality gets added, we can maintain that automated testing against RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 and future versions. So um, what we have today uh, in Galaxy and on GitHub, we have this uh, Linux system roles project. From that, we publish pub uh, publish that in Galaxy. So if you're an existing Ansible user, you can simply type Ansible Galaxy install uh, Linux system roles dot network or dot firewall or whatever, whichever one you want. We also package them in Fedora as a Linux system roles RPM package. And in RHEL, they are packaged as um, RHEL system roles RPM package. Um, and the reason for that is we have use cases where we need to make these accessible, like from the DVD ISO image and things like that, uh, because people might want to, to do automation where they don't necessarily have network access. So um, not, not everyone is, is quite accessible to the, the internet and able to use directly from Ansible Galaxy. So we're looking at a variety of other things like Automation Hub, uh, that um, the Ansible team is working on and different things like that, providing multiple ways to access it. But the versions that we package is what we can say, this is the tested version that we're packaging and supporting um, for enterprise use, but the same team is working on the same stuff and the Fedora CI testing is doing a lot of the, the testing. So the stuff in Galaxy is really good too. But the stuff in Galaxy, you're gonna be seeing change at a faster rate uh, until we package it and ship it, for example, into, um, into RHEL. So multiple ways of accessing it. And so what we provide today is network, storage, SE Linux, TimeSync, uh, PostFix, and KDump. Uh, with RHEL 8.1, we started uh, providing one, a workload role uh, for basic SAP HANA configuration, um, as well as free IPA identity management is also available in Galaxy. Um, and I think, where's Thomas? I think we're going to be shipping that in RHEL soon. Yes. Oh, it is an 8.1. Awesome. Thank you. I didn't realize we were actually shipping it, um, so my apologies. Um, yeah, so free IPA, if you're not familiar with that, it's a really awesome uh, identity management system. Um, I, I think they have a whole nother presentation. Thomas, you're going to be presenting on automating IDM, right? So uh, look for that session. He'll be using these as examples. And some other things that we're actively working on, scoping out requirements for our uh, firewall. We already have a proof of concept firewall role in, uh, in our project in Galaxy, so you can try it out and test it. Uh, we're making some revisions to it before we declare it stable uh, or before we start shipping it as an RPM package. And then additional application workload roles for Microsoft SQL Server and things like that. The logging role will help you stand up or standardize uh, logging profiles. So like if you need high performance logging or 
um, lossy logging use cases and, and setting up like a centralized our syslog server or setting up rel to log to an elastic search it'll help you take care of all of those different use case scenarios um, so lots of stuff kernel bootloader we got a lot of stuff we're excited about that we're we're working on so um, you'll see those gradually appear in galaxy and fedora and then uh, i think we have two or three lined up for the rel 8 dot three release, so we're pretty excited about the new stuff we're working on. So that's the general overview, and I think now I'm going to hand it over to Pavel, and he'll take over for the demo. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Trey, for the introduction, and as Trey said, uh, the main feature, yeah. the control. Oh. The main feature of uh, Linux system roles, compared to maybe some uh, random roles that you can find, is uh, supporting multiple releases and hiding the changes away from you. So how exactly are we uh, doing this? So uh, one uh, class of changes is just simple, uh, like package renames, renames of configuration files, renames of services. Those are easy enough to handle. But then we have more substantial changes, like uh, uh, change of the, uh, the complete implementation of a given functionality may uh, be replaced by something else. And those implementations of a given functionality we call providers. And so the, our roles uh, support multiple providers when appropriate. And some examples, uh, canonical example is our time sync role. Note that it's not called crony role because it uh, abstracts away uh, the details of crony and it supports both uh, NTPD and uh, Crony, so we have two providers for the time sync role, and they are configured in the same way. So we, you uh, put the same variables and you just specify the pro provider and it writes out the Crony or NTPD configuration as appropriate. Another classical example is uh, network role, when we can configure networking via the old init scripts or uh, network manager. Logging, uh, we have uh, just one provider, rcslog, but it's uh, prepared to accept uh, other providers, but I'm not claiming that we will ever support it, but the, the possibility is there. And the, those providers, as I said, uh, implement the same interface, or at least a common subset of, of this interface, because of course not all the providers will support all, all the possible features. So now we'll, I will introduce some of the roles. Uh, I will not introduce all of them, but I will select a uh, particular subset. First one is uh, time sync, which is a uh, medium complexity role, let's say. And the interesting thing about time sync is that it uh, supports those two providers. So it accepts a time sync NTP provider uh, variable, which can be set to NTPD or crony. And then the rest of the configuration is same. And what happens if you don't specify this variable, then it chooses an appropriate default for the given system. If no time sync service is running, if there is a time sync service running, it respects your choice. And so for all the versions of RHEL 6, it would be, uh, the default would be NTPD, but for new ver newer versions of RHEL 6 and RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 and Fedora, the default would be Chrome. So this is the example playbook for uh, complete application of the time sync, time sync role. Then the networking, and this is one of the most uh, complex and I would say the most uh, useful uh, roles, but I will show just one slide about it because there's another talk by, by Till on, on Sunday and I also talked about it, uh, or we talked about it uh, the last year. So uh, as I said, the network role is the example playbook. The network role also sub supports uh, providers network manager and init scripts. The default for L6 is init scripts. For new releases, it's a network manager. And uh, what is important, it's uh, the network role actually doesn't manage directly interfaces by uh, connection profiles, which are concept in network manager and in this script have, uh, have the, uh, the appropriate scripts which are mapped to, uh, mapped to connections. It 
detects a list of uh, connections and uh, the feature it can uh, set are uh, many. One of them is uh, runtime state, up, down. Persistent state, that means uh, connection is uh, present or absent on the system. It supports Ethernet uh, devices. It supports uh, IP protocol conf configuration both 4 and 6, uh, automatic via DHCP or static like here. It supports bonding and teaming. Uh, bonding is more official. Teaming is, uh, let's say, in preview. Uh, it supports VLANs. Here's actually an uh, example of bond. We configure a bond and one uh, member interface of, of the bond. It supports VLANs. It supports bridges, InfiniBand, MacVLAN. So here's an example. As I said, a list of connections. This is a bond with a defined IP address and a member of the bond. We can uh, say what interface name uh, should uh, the connection be bound to if uh, this is not uh, equal to the connection name. And we, uh, we apply the network call with those, with those variables. So now the storage role. This is quite new, so I'm going to speak about it uh, longer. Uh, the principle is to simplify local storage configuration. This means uh, providing concise model to describe the, the storage layout. This means the, the model of uh, variables accepted by the role. Also provide reasonable defaults. Uh, now in Fedora, you have a default file system of XFS, and the, the default uh, storage layout is uh, LVM. But this may change. Maybe in the future, it will be Stratis. So we don't uh, require the users to specify what they want, and we apply the default from, uh, from the system they are running. But of course, uh, Stratis and LVM would have to be uh, managed by the same interface to have the, this consistent experience. So this uh, then provides a requirement for this concise model, because it has to be abstract enough to uh, cover multiple implementations. Also, uh, this is related, it handles non-essential details uh, automatically, like creating a partition or not. It uh, chooses, if you don't specify it, chooses uh, a default, which currently is to not create a partition, but create LVMs directly on, on the disk to simplify, uh, to simplify the layout, but this, this may change. And uh, it reuses the existing storage management logic. What does it mean in practice? It uses uh, the Blivet library, which is also used in the Anaconda installer. So the, the layout and the details should be the same as provided, as created by the, by the installer. Unfortunately, this is one consequence. Uh, the Blivet library is not available at the required version in RHEL 6, so we can manage only RHEL 7 and Eight and of course, recent versions of Fedora. So now so some examples. Uh, simple example, we have an example playbook uh, which creates a file system directly on a disk without volume management. So we have a volumes, uh, volumes uh, variable which says that we want to uh, mount it as uh, slash backup, it, the disk should be SDC, and the file system type is commented out because uh, the role chooses uh, suitable default, which is, uh, which is XFS. Now what, uh, what about, uh, this, is, this was just a whole disk, now what about volume management? So uh, for this, uh, we are getting back to the Consistent, consistent configuration. So we choose an abstract model where we have two, uh, two layers of configuration. We have pools, and inside the pools, we nest volumes. And for LVM, pool is just a volume group, and volume is logical volume, but for other volume managers, uh, the terminology may be different, but we will abstract it uh, in the same, same way. So LVM is... Uh, for pools, LVM is the default and actually the same, uh, the only supported one right now. So we create a volume group on those two disks. And inside the 
the volume group, we create the volumes. We create two, uh, two volumes with a given size. Again, the file system type doesn't need to be specified if you don't, if you don't want. And we mount them. And we actually, uh, we actually also uh, configure them in FS lab so they are mounted on boot. So this is all handled by, by, the, by the row. We can provide, if needed, we can provide the file system type explicitly. So if you want, you can make sure it is X4, even if the default changes. You can, you can uh, provide, X, uh, you can provide uh, X4, whatever is supported on the system. You can set uh, some uh, file system label, file system create options, or mount options. Those will be, of course, file system specific. So when you, when you do this, you must make, sh make sure that you understand the appropriate options for, for a given file system. So what's the status now? We have a, a stable version released already in the Galaxy, version 1.1, I believe. It's uh, included recently in RL 8.1. Uh, what is supported is what I showed the whole disk, and so with uh, single partition. Uh, basic LVM uh, support, and what will we uh, support in no particular order is uh, encryption and D-rate uh, LVM thin provisioning because those are just the classical uh, LVM uh, logical volumes. Uh, Multipath, also LVM rate in addition to MD rate, and video compression and deduplication, and possibly a host of other features like uh, other <coughs> volume types like Stratis, if there's demand for this. So now about uh, some challenges in, uh, in the storage role. So uh, I will first speak about the most important one because even if the storage role supports what you, what you need and supports the system that you need and has a nice and uh, logical uh, and abstract configuration uh, layout uh, of, of variables. If it uh, happens to destroy your data, you will still probably not be very happy with, uh, with the result. So the most important challenge is not destroying your data. And this was actually quite a challenge. Because the, the role doesn't, uh, doesn't remove uh, Volumes which are not specified in, in the in the variables, but about uh, what about uh, conflicting volumes? If you have a if you have a volume already on the system and you uh, create you specify that you want a volume with the same name, but a different file system type, and we cannot convert from XFS to X4 or vice versa. So the role would have to uh, delete the volume and recreate it. Or let's say you, you um, by mistake, you, uh, you give it a disk where there's already an existing partition or existing file system, and you want to create LVM on it or vice versa. You don't want uh, the disk to be wiped in this, in this case. Of course, the detection is uh, not 100% reliable in those cases, but at least when we can detect it, uh, we uh, don't remove it because we have a variable storage safe mode, uh, which defaults to yes and which uh, tells the role to not uh, do such uh, possibly unintended and unsafe operations. So this uh, prevents removing and creating existing objects. But it doesn't uh, protect ed again uh, against uh, intended removal because if you say that you want such a volume to be absent, it, the role will remove it because it it's, in this case, it's presumably not a mistake. It's uh, what you asked for. So another, another challenge is for uh, those are uh, like challenges more for the future, future development. So th those are stuff that people would uh, probably like to have, but they are kind of hard to implement. One is automatic device name, where uh, when one uh, wants to create a file system on LVM, one needs to supply mount point and also the logical volume name. So we want, 
that is to consider uh, not having to supply the logic volume name and having it deduced uh, automatically via some, let's say, default from, from the mount point, mount, uh, point name. Also, automatic size, if you want to use the full uh, size of the, of the disk, it shouldn't be necessary to specify the size. Another is automatic disk selection. If there are unused uh, disks, uh, you should not be forced to specify the disks by the names, which can be even changing, but it uh, should be possible to just uh, say that you want all the disks or the three disks, and the role would create the layout on, on all the disks. And also uh, size uh, specified as uh, percentage of the total space. Why they are challenging because it's easy enough for a new deployment, but then it's a question what to do if uh, the system changed. Like if we choose to uh, do LVM on all the disks and then you add a new disk, what should the subsequent application of the role do when there's already this uh, volume group? So uh, we are thinking that the key is to preserve uh, the current configuration when it's already there and not adding new disks. Also for percentage base size, of course, we cannot support it as percentage of the free space because if we say 100% uh, of the free space, next time uh, there will be no free space and the next run would uh, use uh, zero or any, any, other for, uh, any other percentage, it would be a problem uh, indeed. So this means that we have to specify the percentage of the percentage of the total. So now I will do a demo. The, uh, the objective of the demo is to configure a VM so that it has uh, uh, one co uh, more configured network interface. I will set a large MTO on this interface. I will create a VLAN. I will access a disk over iSCSI over this, uh, this VLAN. I will create a LVM on this disk and mount the, log mount the logical volumes. I will export them over NFS. And I will uh, enable firewall, and the NFS must be must be working when enabling the firewall. But I will use that. Time check. We're at the 30 minute mark. Okay. And I will actually use a video because uh, the network is too slow here. So let me show you the playbook. So Can you read that? Does he need to make the font larger? Okay. This is the biggest that extends supports. We do have all this in a. We do have all of this in a GitHub repo, so that you can access it later. The link is at the end of the slide deck. So I show here the uh, the assumptions for the for the for this example because uh, I created a. I scan the target listening on on the on the host, and I will not show how to do this because I don't have the time. I will really show only the, the configuration of the virtual machine, so it uses some variables. 
which uh, tell to it to which uh, to which iSCSI server to connect and what uh, directories to export. And first of all, I create the network configuration. So I set up the, uh, the Ethernet interface with the large M MTU. I could uh, bind it to the interface, the profile to the interface via the name, but I don't need to because they are named the same. I could also bind it via the MAC address. I configure an IP address on it, and I configure a VLAN on, on this uh, Ethernet interface, so I specify the parent, which refers to this one, VLAN, I, uh, VLAN ID, and also an IP address on the VLAN. Then the iSCSI, uh, iSCSI initiated configuration. For, for this, we don't have a role yet, so I do it, let's say, manually using, uh, using uh, standard Ansible modules. I start the iSCSI D, uh, daemon. I make it connect to the iSCSI target. And this provides uh, the name of the disks that, that it will create. Finally, I use the storage row to create uh, the volume group on, this, uh, on those disks. So the storage pool, the volume group is called export uh, VG. And it has two volumes shared with a given size, with a given mount point. And users, I changed the file system type here and also with the, with the given mount point. I then make the directories uh, world readable so we can access them over NFS without worrying about, uh, about authentication. And I export them via Oasis roles. This is uh, our sister project. We don't have a yet a Linux system role for it. NFS exporting, so I'm using this one. This can be also obtained from Ansible Galaxy. And I'm uh, sharing those two directories to the, to the VM host. And finally, I'm using the network role, uh, sorry, the fiber role, also part of Linux system roles, to enable the NFS service and to enable, uh, to enable firewall D. We are applying the whole, the whole playbook. I'm doing the recording because uh, with the network here, I found out it's, it's too slow. The, it, hang, it hangs at the installing packages and it has to install packages multiple times. So uh, the networking at this time has been already applied and it tested the connectivity, it does it every time because you may have changed the, your management interface. Now we're setting up the iSCSI initiator and now we are applying the storage role. This is uh, lots of, this is a complex role so it, it has lots of tasks so it will print uh, lots of messages. So now it finished, uh, export, uh, so it finished uh, mounting those file systems, and now we are exporting uh, the NFS, uh, uh, the directories of NFS, and finally, we allow NFS on the firewall. And we exported those NFS shares. 
So here I'm on the virtual uh, machine host, and I'm mounting from the from the VM this one uh, this one directory, the export shared directory. And uh, I show that uh, one can see the the file, the, the test file that I created in this directory. Now I will show what, how it lo looks inside the inside the virtual machine. So those are the network interfaces. You can see the, uh, the VLAN here, ETH1, with the NTU. Also the VLAN with the appropriate uh, IP address. I will show the configuration of the devices, of, of the disk devices here. You see uh, the, the disk with the two uh, logical volumes mounted as uh, those two mount points. And finally, I will uh, show that this is really the iSCSI, uh, the iSCSI disk. Because this is a utility which shows the SCSI, uh, the SCSI properties, and you see it's uh, indeed iSCSI. So, end of demo. Logging log, I will skip this one. We don't have time anyway, and also the author of the logging log, unfortunately, couldn't uh, come to DevConf. So, how many of you uh, consider using a Linux system ROS now? So, not everybody, and uh, how many of you consider uh, or are already writing Ansible roles or consider writing Ansible roles? I see def definitely some people who wouldn't uh, consider uh, Linux system roles. So at the end, I will provide some, some uh, notes about implementing Ansible, uh, Ansible roles, which are not specific to Linux system roles. So even those who implement their own roles maybe can learn something. Well, uh, so the challenges uh, ma uh, mainly, mainly revolve at, uh, around respecting the previous setting, the previous state of the system. And I'm now speaking about uh, actually interface challenges because uh, we want to provide a stable interface. This means that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't change it because uh, if we provide uh, a way to hide the changes in the other underlying system, but we change the role, we create the same problem again. So we have to design the interface uh, in a stable way. And uh, so those are interface design changes. For implementation, we can always change it if we, if we res uh, respect the previous, uh, the previous uh, interface. So about respecting previous settings, this is actually an interface question. 
whether we want to declare complete state or to declare only to declare changes to the system. Let's uh, show some example uh, using the SLinux curl, which I haven't shown, but it's simple enough. It can set Selenix booleans. And the question is whether it should, uh, when you list the Selenix booleans, whether it should only uh, set those booleans and to drop all the previous modifications to reset the system to, uh, to, to a clean state, or whether it should just add uh, this one uh, boolean and keep all the previous, uh, previous ones. So uh, let's suppose we would choose to drop all the previous modifications and only set this one. So we have an example of a Samba playbook which sets uh, one uh, boolean for, for Samba. But uh, now let's suppose we have also NFS playbook, which sets uh, some Boolean for NFS. And now we want to combine the two playbooks, or so run them for, uh, from a master playbook, or apply the two to, a same, to the same host. What happens? Here we just clobbered the, the Boolean here. So for this reason, at least by default, we, in, in those cases, always preserve the previous state and only apply the, the changes to it. Hey, Pavel, we're almost out of time. Could we ask the audience if they have any questions and get their feedback? I think so. So, uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? And then if we have time, we can go through a little bit more. Yes. Oh, of course, because each role has a... Ah. Yeah, he was asking, um, is there a place where all of the variables and input parameters are documented? Do you want to take it? So uh, each role has a uh, readme file, which you can see on GitHub. Or it is reproduced on Ansible Galaxy, and it's also included in the package, also formatted as HTML, so you can, you can see what the row does and what uh, variables it supports. Yes, Martin. In the storage roles, you mentioned some feature about automatically picking drives and so on. Uh, and isn't that dangerous if you want to roll, uh, run a role multiple times? I mean, they are supposed to be idempotent, right? So like if I run them a second time, they shouldn't change anything. But it seems like they would always grab the next two available disks and so on. So. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, that's why I listed it among the challenges, uh, let's say the challenges uh, or challenging uh, features. The, and uh, I, th I think, uh, well, we think that the right answer is uh, only to uh, be able to say that you want all free disks, and then on the next run, uh, there are no free disks. But of course, uh, of course, the uh, volume group is already there, so you don't need to, uh, to do anything. But uh, that said, uh, if the volume group was already there, even if we picked uh, only one of them, the second time, as the volume group is already there, it would not modify it. That, that what I mentioned, uh, we want to make sure that uh, this, the second time it runs, it doesn't do this uh, automatic detection because it already has something and it's satisfied. Uh, so you, in this case, it would see that like the mount point that is associated with so that drive already exists, and then it would leave it alone. Yes, yes. Okay.
Yeah, do you want to answer that? So the question was, uh, when you use uh, the row statement in the playbook, it uh, exposes all the row variables uh, to the whole playbook run. And uh, how, how safe it is, is it, and whether we should not use the include row. But uh, the answer is uh, that uh, that's why the row variables are prefixed always with the, with the row name to to uh, at least reduce the possibility of accidental uh, collisions. But I'm afraid that uh, the include row statement also keeps the variables. It, it doesn't? It's isolated. It's isolated? But if you use import row, it's, uh, it's like uh, row, say. Import row, no. include. Ah, okay. There's a difference. Yeah, so, uh, it is definitely then safer to use uh, in good role, but uh, we are working under the assumption that one would use uh, the roles statement, and so they should be safe even, even for this. Another question? Any other questions? Yes, sir. So you just so showed us uh, TimeSync um, supports NTPD and Crony2. And do you plan to support uh, SystemD, TimeSync also? Uh, I don't think so. We do not yet support SystemD, TimeSync D, do we? Well, so we don't support it definitely right now, but uh, I think it depends on the demand wh whether we would support it. But right now, we don't have uh, any specific plans uh, to do it. Yeah. So if that's a feature request you would like to ask uh, or request, you can go to our GitHub repo and open an issue. And uh, any feedback that you have to share, anything that you would like out of these, we'd love for you to open a, an issue on GitHub or a Bugzilla. Uh, at bugzilla.redhat.com, and let us know what you need out of them. If, if they don't meet your, meet your needs, we're very, very interested in your feedback. Uh, so let us know what features you want us to add. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're, um, we have a few basic examples. Um, so the slides will be made available as a PDF, and at the end uh, um, is a link to our GitHub repo where there is a DevConf, DevConf demo folder, and it includes a couple of different uh, demos right now. There's, there's one that uses them as an example for setting up an image builder node, and then Pavel's will be uploaded later today, I think. It is already there. Oh, it's already there. So we have a few examples. We're also looking at for those uh, workload examples. We want to have like an overall end-to-end -end solution playbook that demonstrates using these to set up, for example, Microsoft SQL Server and taking care of like all of the different things you need to take care of. Um, so we don't have, we only have a few basic examples right now, but over the next year we expand, expect to have multiple. Also, you don't need to use all the rows uh, at the start. You can start one by one because right now they are pretty independent. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question is, can I specify the block device by UUID or by... Yeah by like the PCI bus path. Do you want to answer that? Some of, uh, some of the methods are supported, but I'm not in entirely sure what, uh, what is supported and what, uh, what, is not, what is not supported. But uh, at least I think the UID links uh, are supported, but it needs to be the, the device UID button and not the UID of the file system. <coughs> because there are... There, Yeah, yeah, this yeah. one, okay. 
Yeah, actually, so not today, but that's one of our goals. So for example, as a database administrator, the storage team gives me a new 100 gigabyte LUN or a terabyte LUN, uh, and all they give me is the WWID or the, the worldwide name or whatever you wanna call it. Um, and so how can we provide you multiple ways, both for networking and storage, to have multiple ways of expressing the device that you want to use. So for storage, that might be the Linux Blocks device name, might be the multipath name, uh, or it might be the WWID uh, that the storage array presents, and then let the role figure out the multipath names and everything so that you as an admin don't have to worry about it. You just plug in the WWID hit go and it just takes care of that for you. So that's one of our goals and aspirations is uh, to require the user to only provide us what details they must provide or want to express, but not require you to specify all the typical default values. Let's assume recommended defaults um, so that you don't have to express all the details unless you want to. You, you have the power to express more details. But otherwise, just give me the WWID and I'll just get it mounted for you and take care of the file system for you with the defaults. Does that make uh, sense? Anyway, I'm sure some of the links under slash devs slash disk by something are supported, but I'm not in exactly sure right now which ones are supported right now. So. At least some of them are, are definitely supported. I just wanted to say something, if, if we're ready to wrap up. Oh. Just, just to close the room. Okay.